Start with some good long, deep in and out breaths. Long in, long out. To alert yourself to the breath. Then the next question is, does it feel good? If it feels good, keep it up. If not, you can change the rhythm of your breathing. You can think of all kinds of variations, shorter, even deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter, faster, slower. Experiment with different ways of breathing to see what feels best right now. Gaining a sense of pleasure in the breath is an important principle in gaining concentration. The mind doesn't like to settle down with things that are unpleasant. If the breath is uncomfortable, it's going to run away. So you've got to bring it back. And once the breath is comfortable, start thinking of how that comfortable energy can spread through the body. Because when we talk about the breath, it's not just the air coming in and out of the lungs. It's the flow of energy in the body as a whole. The energy in the nerves, the energy in the blood vessels, and all the muscles. When you breathe in, do the different parts of the body feel nourished? Is there a sense of easy flow or is there a sense of blockage? If there's a tension someplace that's going to be blocking things, so just go through the body and see where you can iron out the tension, comb it out, and it's like a tangle in your hair. If you don't feel anything in particular, just ask yourself, where, is it? where are things most tense? Relax, relax, as you maintain an erect posture. Check your spine. Does it seem to be in good alignment? If not, relax the muscles that seem to be pulling it out. You're working with two kinds of pleasure. There's the physical pleasure, being with the breath, which the Buddha doesn't count as a sensual pleasure. It's called the pleasure of form, the way you feel the body from within. That's different from the pleasures of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. The Buddha places it on a higher level, because it doesn't really have to depend on things outside. And as he says, it's a blameless pleasure, in the sense that you don't have to harm anybody to gain it. And at the same time, it doesn't intoxicate the mind. It doesn't befuddle or cloud the mind. That actually makes the mind a lot clearer. So that's the physical pleasure of the breath. Then there's just the mental pleasure of working with the breath energies in the body and seeing that you can make changes in how the body feels from within. It's a way of helping the body along. If the breath energy flows well, it's going to be conducive to your health. So here's something you can explore, something you can be curious about, learn about here in the present moment. It's not just in, out, in, out. The breath has lots of ins and outs in all different parts of the body. It can have a different effect on different organs in the body. And you can get a sense of that from within. When you have this combination of physical pleasure and mental pleasure, the mind is happy to settle down. You don't have to force it. It's like giving a child an interesting game to play, something that captures the child's imagination. You don't have to place a, the child under lock and key, and the child will stay home and play with the game. Gaining this pleasure is an important part of the path. We hear about the middle path between indulgence or devotion to sensual pleasure and devotion to self-torture. And it's easy to think about it as being someplace in the middle, like a kind of an equanimous, neutral feeling. 
But that's not the case. The Buddha talks about an alternative pleasure. Because as he says, if there is no alternative pleasure to sensual pleasure, then the mind's going to go there. No matter how much it may understand the drawbacks of sensual pleasure, when it wants to avoid pain, it'll go straight to the sensual pleasure, unless it has an alternative. And here you are providing it with that alternative, and this is the alternative that's on the path. This is the middle way. This too is a devotion to pleasure, but it has different consequences. Remember, we're on a path, we're going someplace, which means we have to think about where our actions will lead us. And the act of indulging in pleasure or the act of indulging in pain will have their consequences. And so we're working toward the ultimate sukha, that's the Buddha's word for pleasure, happiness, well-being, bliss. It covers that whole range of basically feeling good, having a sense of well-being. And it's a deathless pleasure, something that will not change. Once you found it, it's there. It's, it's there already, it's just you haven't found it yet. As for other pleasures and pains, we have to rank them as to whether they're helpful on that path or not. The pleasure of concentration is one of the ones that's helpful. As for other pleasures and pains, it's going to be an individual matter. Are there some pleasures that the Buddha said are categorically not part of the path? He says it's not the pleasure of just wanting to think about sensual pleasures all the time. That's what sensuality means. It doesn't mean the sensual pleasures. It's our fascination with them. This is not part of the path. This, our ability to think about or fantasize about food, whatever. We can think about things for long periods of time, the pleasures we get, sights, sounds, smells, taste, tactile sensations. And that's where our real attachment is. The things themselves, the people, whatever, that we get the pleasure out of. We're not nearly as attached to them as we are with, with the mind's fascination, with thinking about the pleasures, planning for them. Those kinds of, that kind of pleasure, the Buddha said, is off the path. Also the pleasure that could come from killing, stealing, having illicit sex, lying, taking intoxicants. Those pleasures are off the path as well. But aside from that, you find that there are certain pleasures you have in life, and when you indulge them, it doesn't have an effect on your meditation, doesn't have an effect on the path, those are okay. The same goes with pain. There's some pains that are actually good to sit through so you can learn lessons from them, and sometimes to counteract unskillful mental states you need to take what the Buddha calls are painful meditation topics, like the contemplation of the foulness of the body or what happens to the body after death. These are things that are unpleasant to think about, but they're useful. That's a kind of pain to be encouraged. Another one that the Buddha encourages is when you realize that there's work to be done in the mind. An awakening is possible, but you haven't gotten there yet. That's a painful thought, because it means there's work you've got to do. The Buddha says, think about that. Encourage that. All too often you hear we shouldn't have any goals, because if you have goals then you start feeling bad about yourself. That may work on a weekend meditation retreat, when they're afraid that you're going to put too much pressure on yourself. But when you're thinking about meditation as a lifetime process, training the mind is a lifetime process. You've got to have goals. And the tension of realizing that there's a goal that you haven't yet attained. It's like the tension on a, the string of a, a bow. That tension is what allows the arrow to fly far. So certain pains and certain pleasures that are actually useful on the path, and they're judged as to what consequences they have when you indulge in them. As I said, in some cases they're categorical yes and no for certain pleasures and pains, and in other cases, though, 
It's going to be an individual matter. And it's when you learn how to see the effect that a pleasure or a pain is having on the mind. That's when you develop your own discernment. The Buddha has a lot of do's and don'ts, but then there's a lot of area where he says you've got to explore on your own and look for yourself at what is happening in terms of cause and effect in your own life. And those are the areas where you start developing your own discernment. That's what the middle path means, or the middle way means. It doesn't mean that you're in a neutral state all the time. It means that you're looking at your pleasures and pains to see how conducive they are on the path to the ultimate well-being. It's like being an athlete in training. You want to win the game. And you know there are certain foods that will be bad for your body as you train, so you've got to put them aside, no matter how much you may like them. There are certain pains that you have to take on in the course of training the body. Other pains are they're going to harm the body. If you push the body too hard, it's going to get in the way. So you have to learn how to develop your own sense of what's just right. Which pains are good, which pains are not. Which pleasures are good, which pleasures are not. For the purpose of that goal. Well, it's the same here as you practice the Dharma. Certain pleasures you've got to give up because they're going to get in the way. There may not be anything inherently bad in them, but you find that if you indulge in them, it's going to get in the way. Other pleasures are not harmful at all. So other pleasures are actually helpful. Like the pleasure of being here with the breath right now. Learn how to see it as a pleasure. Years back we had a woman bring a friend of hers to one of our afternoon meditations out under the trees. And it was a lovely day. The sun was warm, but not too warm. There was a slight breeze. And at the end of the hour, the friend opened her eyes and said she would never suffered so much in her life. We can do this to ourselves. You can sit here and be miserable, feeling that you're undergoing sensory deprivation. Or you can have the right attitude seeing that here's your opportunity to learn something about the breath, to learn how to use this element or this property we have in the body to create a sense of genuine well-being right here. There are ways of breathing that are really blissful, rapturous even. This is something we can explore, that we can develop, and it's part of the pleasure that leads to a greater pleasure, the greater well-being of unbinding the deathless. So it's your choice as to what you're going to make of the potentials that you have right here, right now. Keep in mind always that what you do will have consequences. When you indulge in a pleasure, you indulge in a pain, it will have consequences. It's not just a floating event with no repercussions. So have a clear sense of where you want to go, and what's helping you along the way, and what's getting in the way. That's what it means to be on the middle way. It's a path that requires discernment. Extremes are easy. Easy in the sense that they don't require much thought. But finding the point of just right requires discernment. And it's in developing a sensitivity at that point of just right in different circumstances that your discernment becomes sharp enough that it can see something that goes beyond.